welcome to MedCity News' Invest Pop Health Conference. My name is Orunduti Parmar. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of MedCity News. And every year we discuss how to improve population health and chronic disease management at this conference. And I think this year, all of you will agree that this year, more than ever before, this topic assumes vital importance. So before we kick things off with a wonderful panel today, I wanted to share a little bit about MedCity News in case some of you out there uh, don't know much about us. So as I mentioned, I'm the Editor-in-Chief. I've been here since 2016. The company was founded in late 2008 to cover innovation in healthcare. We are a national publication drawing nearly 2 million page views and 500,000 uniques per month. We cover biopharma, digital health, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as hospitals and payers in the context of the industry's overall transformation. We host conferences too, focusing on investment, population health, precision medicine, digital health and patient engagement. And like all of you can't wait to get back to in-person conferences. We also accept outside con content through our MedCity Influencers Program. We also have something called Med Citizens, which is a membership-based program for startups with certain editorial and event benefits. Uh, earlier this year, we launched the MedCity Pivot podcast, uh, recognizing that all of us in our personal and in our professional lives were, were pivoting. And so we've been able to highlight some really interesting conversations and perspectives, including that of Zeke Mianul and other uh, folks sort of leading changes uh, within our industry. You can always email me at aparmar at mencitynews.com where you can suggest future podcast guests. I wanted to thank our sponsor Merck. Uh, without uh, them, obviously this conference would not be possible. And next, a big thank you to our partner, the New Orleans Business Alliance, and especially to Quentin Messer Jr., uh, the president and CEO of NOLA BA. I'm going to uh, stop sharing right now and allow Quentin to share a few words with you. Please go ahead, Quentin. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Ms. Parmar, and thank you to the entire MedCity team. It has been an incredible journey for us to even be associated with MedCity. Um, we were just talking before we came on. It was about three years ago that I first became acquainted with Med City, and it's been tremendous to watch its growth as an organization that's at the forefront of, of telling the story of innovation in so many different important um, sectors of healthcare and, and associate uh, biotech technologies. Um, look, I am honored to be here. I want to thank all my colleagues at the New Orleans Business Alliance, but particularly um, two folks who really are instrumental in this, my colleagues, Jeanette Weiland, who's our VP of Bio and Innovation and Special Projects, and then Valerie Huntley, who's our uh, basically our Director of Strategic Engagement, who is um, such a wizard uh, behind the scenes. I want to make sure that we give sufficient time to have really what I think is a tremendous conversation. We're grateful to, Met, to Merck for their investment and believing in this work. I am honored um, at this stage and I'm not gonna um, upstage, but I just wanna shout out Dr. Takesha Davis, one of the panelists, um, in addition to being a, a leader um, in uh, healthcare, she's also a board member of the New Orleans Business Alliance and a civic um, leader. I won't get into everything that she does um, in the New Orleans region, but she is a tremendous dynamo. And then Dr. Conrad Taylor, um, Tyrod, Conrad Kelly, um, I want to also call him Tyrod Taylor, uh, who I had as a fantasy football player. But anyway, um, he has been a leader in um, just spreading the message about the important uh, work about how do you deal with, particularly for, com for many communities, uh, deal with chronic mobil uh, morbidities. So we are incredibly grateful. This is important to the Business Alliance because at the end of the day, if we are going to be a healthier city, not only in our bodies, but also in our wallets, we have to have healthy bodies. We have to have people who are able to live with, treat, and manage chronic conditions such as diabetes. So we are incredibly humble. I could go on and on but I'm about to get the uh, 
the hook sign or the, the, the box. So I want to thank Med City News again. I want to thank all of my colleagues. I uh, particularly want to thank Merck for stepping up and, 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 and stepping into this. And I just can't wait to um, hopefully be when we can be all back together, um, together in New Orleans. So thank you so much, Ms. Parmore and the entire uh, MetaCity News team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Quentin, for those kind words. We also appreciate the partnership and the support that all of you have shown us over the last couple of years. So um, I, before we launch into the discussion, I wanted to quickly um, introduce our speakers. So first we have Conrad Kelly, who's the Executive Director of Policy and Social Determinants at Merck. And then we have Dr. Takesha Davis, CEO of New Orleans East Hospital. So welcome to you both. Um, Conrad, if you would, uh, don't mind switching on your video, there we go, nice to see you. So I'll start with you, um, Conrad. Uh, I assume that diabetes is a challenge that all um, providers, nurses, patients, all of these people are dealing with, uh, and they are taking a stab at it through different, different perspectives. What made you and Mark decide that a documentary was the best way to address this huge uh, challenge that we have globally and certainly in the United States? Great question, and thank you again for having me. Uh, I think the simplest answer is that we realize that so many of the disparities that you see in diabetes has to do with stigma. And there's such great stigma, whether people think it's that because people are lazy or because they don't want to take care of themselves or they eat unhealthy. But so much of that, as we've all come to appreciate the social determinants of health, play such a significant role in people's ability to manage their condition. And so we really saw the, the, the notion of using film to be able to tell stories, to humanize the experiences that these individuals were dealing with and to be able to start to unpack and, and debunk some of these untruths that people had around these individuals who were living with this condition. And so for us, it was really you know, an opportunity to, to go into some of the hard hit communities. We went to California, we went to New York and, and the Bronx, uh, we went to Dallas, Texas, we went to Appalachia. And, and to have people actually tell their own stories and to see the connection back throughout their history was an important thing for us to do. So it was completely unscripted. It was just turn on the camera and let people speak. But we also used that uh, vehicle as an opportunity to educate people on food deserts and to educate people on health literacy, to educate people on the bias in the healthcare system and how all of those things combine to really be able to drive the diabetes epidemic that we continue to see in the US. And I think the last thing I'll say about that is you know, when, when you start to look at a condition uh, like diabetes, and oftentimes you hear the numbers, the big numbers of, you know, almost 100 people with prediabetes and 30 million people with diabetes. But I think the one that really stood out to me was when you would talk about the disproportionate impact of diabetes in the black and brown community, I think that fed into the narrative and the stigma that somehow it was just something that these folks were doing culturally why they have it. And I've come to learn that it's not about necessarily genetic as much as it is about uh, policies that have been put in place in the communities where these individuals or these groups are concentrated that lead to them having access to higher caloric foods or living in a food desert or not having the right environmental and structural things that are needed in order to be healthy. So we felt that uh, film was a great medium to be able to tell this story. And I think we had a lot of examples to pull from in this country of how film has changed people's perspective on things that are stigmatized like immigration or uh, LGBTQ or, or even HIV. And so that was really why we chose this as a medium to start the dialogue. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Davis, you are CEO of New Orleans East Hospital. And as Conrad mentioned, so much is about uh, your zip code and uh, not so much your uh, genetic code. So can you sort of create a picture, paint a picture for us. Describe the community that you serve in New Orleans. Absolutely, and um, again, thank you uh, for having me. Um, I serve a community of over 100,000, primarily minority community members, 85% African-American, another 10% um, of uh, Asian um, descent. Uh, and it is a highly impoverished community uh, where there are low rates uh, of 
high school education. Uh, we have uh, a paucity, unfortunately, uh, of economic investment and reinvestment in this area. This is an area uh, that um, was most notably highlighted after uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, to be completely devastated and evacuated. Uh, prior to that, it was an up and coming um, middle class and upper middle class um, suburb of New Orleans uh, that was primarily uh, working class uh, African American school teachers, healthcare professionals, postal workers. Um, that after the, the storms of 2005, uh, there really was a um, intentional lack of reinvestment uh, in this area uh, that um, community members, organizations like NOLA BA are now uh, trying to turn the tide on. But what that has left us with, uh, as Conrad uh, has uh, stated, is an area of particular concentrated disadvantage where we have community members who don't have access uh, to living wage paying jobs who don't have access uh, to uh, educational resources uh, to be able uh, to have uh, ability to attain um, the greatest health that they can. Uh, the hospital uh, that I uh, serve as CEO of that you guys see behind me uh, is a, a very new facility. Uh, we've been here for six years uh, and we knew coming into uh, this uh, community that we didn't need to just rebuild a hospital, but we needed to build uh, a community hub uh, to be able to provide not just sick care, but well care, to look at how we as a hospital uh, could start uh, to tackle some of the social determinants of health, uh, which is not something that hospitals typically do uh, because well patients, frankly, are not um, where we're reimbursed, right? We are reimbursed uh, through a healthcare system um, that prioritizes um, sick care, uh, which means the more tests uh, the, that we can run, uh, the more time that you can spend in the hospital, uh, you get reimbursed. Uh, but nevertheless, we knew that our community needed uh, more than that to tackle preventable diseases like diabetes. Uh, in the community I serve, uh, we have uh, more than twice uh, our state uh, rate and prevalence of diagnosis of diabetes in adults. Uh, nearly 14%, um, most of them are African-American uh, since 2008, as I was looking back, uh, that diabetes has been the second leading cause, underlying cause of death uh, in Louisiana, and that translates uh, to our community. And so in 2017, three years after the hospital was opened, uh, we opened up a diabetes center here uh, in partnership uh, with some of our community members uh, and uh, we have been providing wraparound services, uh, which include access uh, to healthy foods. It is a food desert. Uh, and so we have a farmer's market uh, that we have uh, at the hospital on our campus. We, it is an area that is unfortunately plagued with violence. Uh, so we have a walking path around our hospital because it's, it's safe, it's secure, it's paved, it's lit. Uh, and so we put equipment, exercise equipment, like you would see in any uh, community park uh, around the perimeter of our hospital uh, so that community members could walk safely and have access uh, to physical activity. Um, very often uh, as providers, healthcare providers, uh, we recommend that community members do things, behavioral changes uh, to improve their health uh, and in this case of diabetes, uh, to uh, reduce and manage uh, their the impact of diabetes on them. Um, but as Conrad said, this has to do with decades of federal, state, and local policies that have led to environments of disadvantage that will take more than behavior changes from our community members, but rather system changes uh, from all of us. Um. I'll go to uh, Conrad uh, right now. Dr. Davis mentioned this idea of this intentional lack of investment um, when she's talking about the region that she is responsible for. Mm -hmm. How do you, and, and you are now making an investment, you as in Merck is now making an investment in social determinants, but there's so much skepticism around large pharma companies because of all the profits that you have made. How do you convince the public at large that has been skeptical on, on, you know, on soaring drug profits and soaring drug prices? How do you make that public 
understand that this is the real deal and that there isn't any ulterior motive when you're now going to um, address uh, people that are disadvantaged? Uh, that's a great question. So I think it starts by first acknowledging that people have a right to feel the way that they do. Um, I think for far too long, we've ignored um, why people are skeptical or why they feel the way they do about our industry. And, and I think, you know, especially the communities that Dr. Davis is talking about has had a very checkered uh, history with uh, the healthcare um, industry. And that goes beyond pharmaceutical, but even to our, you know, our public health system. Mm -hmm. And so I think first, before you can get people to trust you, you have to show up, you have to be there. And they have to see you and they have to know that you actually care about listening. And so for us, you know, even the project that we did with the film, that was the best research we could have ever done because we didn't even have to ask the questions. We were just there and people were willing to talk to us and say, this is what my experience is. This is what we're dealing with. And this is the role that you can play because I think we also have to make sure that as an industry, we don't come in with the savior complex. It, it, these communities don't need to be saved. They need to be empowered. Mm -hmm. And so when you are in a position of power and you have a position of privilege, you then have to think about how do you use your power and your, your, uh, your privilege to create a platform for those whose voices can't be amplified. And so for me, you know, first and foremost, the film was a great entree into that. And knowing that we, number one, we called it a touch of sugar. First of all, if anybody was doubting, they're like, somebody at Merck knows what's going on. <laughs> that they didn't come out with some very scientific name, like they knew how people talk about it in these communities. The second piece is that th there is, until, unless you stay for the end credits, you wouldn't have even known that it was Merck who was behind the project. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was important to make sure people saw that there was complete separation between our commercial interests and our interests in making good on our mission to save and improve lives. And so I think the fact that we got patient advocacy groups we went to Hispanic physicians, we went to African-American physicians, we went into the places where people feel like they had been forgotten to give them the opportunity to tell their story. I think it opened the door for us to continue those conversations. And I think that's an important piece of this too, is that we're not gonna get it by giving some check to an HBCU or showing up to the NAACP. They wanna know that you're committed. Mm -hmm. And so I think now what that has allowed us to do is to build a platform where we said, well, what are the, all the issues? So look, we need to have more diversity in our workforce. We need to advocate for policies that are gonna remove these systemic barriers. We need to create more economic inclusion as a major employer in this company. So we need to create jobs. We need to hire people from the community so that there's money that can go back into the community. We need to work together as the business industry to say, what are we doing to create a pipeline and to support the pipeline of STEM education um, so that these kids get an opportunity to now be a voice of reason in their own communities because they've been educated and they can go back and say, hey, I work in this space. I know this information. I have a seat at the table in the company. You don't have to worry that it's all of them trying to take care of us. We are actually there too. And so I think, you know, the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, as we work on building this relationship, transparency is gonna be important. And I do think that we have to find a way to explain the complicated way that our industry is forced to operate. I think Dr. Davis said it well, that the way that the system is incentivized, the fact that they are paid more for the fact that if someone stays in the hospital longer, or people are sicker. Well, at the same time, there's certain nuances in our industry that if we actually attempt to lower the price of our medications, it might actually remove access to our medications for certain populations. So that's not even something that someone would think about that we might even be punished for trying to lower our prices to make it more affordable for certain communities. And so I think, you know, all we can do is to continue to show up, to continue to show up in a way that shows that we want to leverage our, uh, our position of privilege and power to amplify the voices of the community that we're not coming in to try to save them. The fact that we're trying to address the systemic issues that have created this. And at the same time, we have to continue to work on these social determinants because the way I look at it is this, at the end of the day, what we want is to make sure that we can get a return on our investment so we can continue to invest in research and development to solve the ails that plague our communities, right? But at the same time, if the government is spending so much on drug costs and they're not getting the outcomes, then it makes it harder for them to continue to pay for the, um, the innovation. 
And so what we have to do is we have to invest in this 80%, the social determinants that dictate 20% of outcomes. We've got to find a way to be able to tell that narrative, to empower people, to make sure that their vote is going towards the policy is going to create a better opportunity to achieve that holy grail of health equity so that as the government spends less and less and less on health care and invest in social care, then the dollars that are there can afford to pay for those medications that build the pipeline for continued R&D. And so I, I think we owe the people an honest conversation in a very health literate way to explain how the system works. And we have to win them over to get them on our side to say, help us help you. Mm-hmm. And that's what we haven't done a good enough job of. And I hope that me being in my role is an opportunity to know that externally, there's now responsibility to hold us accountable that you know there's someone whose job is to work on social determinants and health equity. And also internally, I have the responsibility to hold our company leaders accountable because my role does exist. And I think the fact that I'm in the position that I'm in, hopefully, is another sign to the community that we are trying to to turn the tide and and turn the ship and right the ship on the relationship that we have with the, uh, you know, the American people. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, Conrad talked about systemic barriers, and I know when we were speaking ahead of the uh, conference for a prep session, you mentioned how you know, the George Floyd murder and, and all the protests that followed was kind of a watershed moment where you know, many of us who are not Black woke up to the fact that there is real uh, you know, injustice happening. It was, it, was too, um, it was too clear to ignore. And you felt like there, was, there has been some movement on the corporate investment fund, uh, cor- corporate investment perspective since that. And you mentioned this really innovative grant that you uh, received uh, from Johnson & Johnson. So can you talk a little bit about what that program is and how you're hoping to leverage some of those funds? It, absolutely, as, as we spoke, um, you know, our, our community members uh, have always known they've lived, it's their lived experience, um, this um, concentrated disadvantage that comes from um, systemic um, racial uh, injustices, uh, not just in healthcare, right, but as we talked about, um, seeing it in um, the George Floyd um, incident and what happens uh, with uh, our uh, uh, social uh, and policing um, arena, what happens in our educational system uh, with them, employment, uh, every aspect of their lives. Uh, and I have seen uh, whether that is uh, a little bit of um, systemic guilt uh, that we are benefiting from from these companies or uh, being more woke, uh, as I mentioned to you, doesn't really matter why uh, to me more than that there is now an intentional um, investment uh, into these issues and coming to uh, establish uh, community leaders, uh, community partners, community voices, as Conrad mentioned. Uh, even for us at our hospital, it's important uh, that we don't um, go into our communities, talk to community members as if we know better, as if we know the solution, uh, that we're coming to them collaboratively uh, to come up with solutions to make sure that they have the ability to uh, attain health equity. Uh, We are are currently working, as you mentioned, with Johnson & Johnson uh, on an innovative project. And it actually came uh, by way of COVID because we should state as well that COVID-19 shown uh, another spotlight on the disproportionate uh, negative impacts of this pandemic uh, on uh, people of color, uh, primarily African-Americans here uh, at our hospital in the city of New Orleans. Uh, over 75% of the deaths have been in African-Americans where we're about make up about 60% Uh, of the population uh, in totality. Uh, So Johnson & Johnson approached us uh, really to look at ways for us to expand uh, COVID-19 testing. What we said to them is that we didn't want to just uh, be able to go into our communities and test, that would be nice, but we wanted to actually use the investment uh, to start to tackle some of the social determinants of health that were leading to the underlying disproportionate impact. Uh, So we didn't just want a mobile unit to go out and swab people for COVID. We wanted a mobile unit that we could retrofit to go into communities and actually provide telehealth visits uh, for our community members who have challenges with access uh, and transportation getting to their appointments. Uh, They work shift jobs where they cannot uh, and don't have the ability to take off and have paid time off. Uh, that we could go to schools who don't have 
school-based health centers uh, and provide um, testing right there in the community uh, so that when they get onto that mobile unit, not only can they get a COVID-19 test, we can check uh, their blood pressure, we can check their blood sugar. And if they need to see their endocrinologist or their cardiologist or their primary care specialist, they can go into a pod, much like we see with gaming buses. Anybody who has kids uh, is probably aware that they're all over the place and you can go into a gaming bus and it's set up for you to play you know, five or six people at a time to play a game. But those tools we can use to connect to healthcare professionals uh, and have community members in a safe way in their community be able to have their preventative health care. So we're really excited uh, about uh, that partnership and being able to then go a step further uh, as we were talking about the trusted voices uh, and work with our community to be able to train uh, community members to be community health workers uh, because their voices in their communities are gonna matter a whole lot more than mine or anybody uh, from Big Pharma and translating, and we do need to translate as Conrad said, this information to our community members in a way that they're empowered to take control of their own health and be able to come up with the solutions that are gonna be most meaningful and most impactful to them. So Conrad, I'm gonna play the devil's advocate for just a second here. Let's assume, this is utopia, but let's assume we're in utopia where these communities are not as neglected as before. Everyone has a you know, decent job. Um, there is access to fresh food, but behavior change is super hard. Just putting a fresh food pharmacy, I'm sorry, fresh food grocery store near a place that only had fast food restaurants doesn't mean automatically people will stop going to McDonald's. Um, how do we, I mean, do these communities know the importance of cooking? How do you train people to cook with these ingredients? It's not just putting stuff, you know, building things and hoping people will come. How do you get sustained behavior change if you're asking them to do certain things that are radically different to what they've done for decades? Wow, that is the, um, that, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> I think everyone, <laughs> <laughs> trying to the big bucks, right? I, I will tell you this, we're probably not as far away from it as we think we are. If you look at how the internet can, can mobilize people rather quickly and change our, our minds about a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think a part of the solution um, does revolve around technology um, and it's about building in certain norms. And so even you know, when it comes to behavior change, you have to kind of create a system to make behavior change happen. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that goes back to what Dr. Davis said, which is now that if we know and we all agree on the outcome and you can incentivize the outcome, which is health, it's amazing how you can start to re-engineer your city so that that's the only outcome that is actually possible. So we, we know this from behavioral psychologists and, and you know, nobody hires more behavioral psychologists than the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, that they know how to trigger something in you so that you take a certain activity or the Apple knows to have a certain notification so they can get you back on your screen um, to open back up your phone because that's how they monetize their business. And so I think the challenge for us is to think about how do you start to do this by making sure number one, people see the positive outcome of them being able to have these behavior changes. And we need to create the tools to make it a little bit easier for people to do, right? So, you know, for me, I always tell people about habits and systems. If I say that I want to have, you know, my goal is to amass wealth, then I need to get good at saving, but I need to have a system that makes saving easier. And so you've seen some of these credit card companies where they'll round up to the next dollar and they'll just put it in a saving account. So it, it automated that decision of saving so that you didn't want, even though you identify that was a goal, now it can make it something that's habit forming without you having to do it. And so I do think that this is where I hope technology goes in the future, that you go into these communities, you try to understand where the system is breaking down. And I think some of it is gonna be, it may have to be incentivized. Some of it is gonna require technology, but I think that the biggest piece of it is how do you co-create these solutions? How do you take these companies and say, I want to go into these communities and I want to invest in you. 
for you to come up with a solution to how to get your community to spend less on this or to eat less of these places. But at the same time, you have to make sure that we understand that we're also creating opportunity because those fast food stores, although we, we, we vilify them, they do help people provide sustenance when there's no other option. It does provide an economic engine for those communities where there is no other option. And so I think some of what we've seen is that we're like, well, we put this, this grocery store there. Why didn't they start eating healthier? Well, no one educated them on what a quote unquote healthy diet is. No one gave them the tools to say, okay, now that I want to go from McDonald's or KFC or churches or Bojangles or wherever to go to the grocery store, the, the fast food restaurants make it very easy to understand what your $10 is going to do. Your $10 is going to get you a bucket of this, a side of this and that. When you go into a grocery store, it's decision overload. Mm -hmm. And so that's a piece of the educational that, that, you know, process that needs to happen is give people the tools so that they can go in and start to have that behavior change. But to your point, you just can't drop a gym in a neighborhood or drop a, a Whole Foods in a neighborhood and expect that people are just going to naturally gravitate towards it, especially if it doesn't feel connected to their culture. And I think that's the piece that's always been missing because oftentimes when you do bring in those major grocery stores and what happens, the mom and pop shops, the corner grocery stores, everything else goes out of business and the dollars that are being put into that grocery store isn't being reinvested in the community. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes that's the unintended consequences that we don't see that people are like, well, I don't understand, why don't they do this? You've got to be able to give them the tools. You've got to give them the resources and once again, they don't need to be saved. They just need to be empowered and they need to understand how everything is connected. And as they start seeing the connectivity, then you see the link between education. You see the, the, the link between education and health education, health literacy and different behaviors. And you start to see how that shows up in presenteeism in school, presenteeism on the job, you know, reduce accidents on the job, you start to see a lot more behavior changes. But I think a big piece of it does start with education and making sure that these communities are given the tools to make the behavior change easier. Because without it, I think it's a slower path to adoption, they'll get there. But people have known this for so long, because unfortunately, because of those systemic injustices, that they've learned to adapt to these behaviors, which is now ingrained into their culture. Right. And so you trying to tell someone not to eat a certain thing or not to drink something or not to, they're like, that's all I've ever known. And so you now have to help them create a new cultural identity that leads to a healthy behavior. And I think that's something that's a little bit harder to do. Mm -hmm. So we've been chatting for a while. Um, I'll continue with my questions, but if the audience uh, has any questions, please feel free to put them in chat and I will be able to direct the questions um, to each of our panelists. So um, Dr. Davis, we just went through an election. You know, there's some legal wrangling going on, but I think most reasonable people agree that we have a president-elect, Joe Biden. Directionally, we have some sense of where he wants to go with healthcare, but again, without the Senate, we don't know whether those things will be possible. But what are you hoping for from a federal policy perspective? I know we spoke a lot about local policy, state policy, but federal policy, what are you looking for? Yes, I, um, I would agree. Most reasonable people I think that we know the outcome of the election and we do have um, high expectations uh, of the incoming um, president and president and vice president elect uh, and the work that they have promised us uh, that they will intentionally do uh, on tackling some of these issues, uh, particularly um, the disproportionate uh, and disparate health outcomes that we see. Uh, in minorities. And so from a policy perspective, uh, I would first, I hope that they really started to change the system to look at health in all policies. Uh, so when they're looking at um, their transportation policies, their education policies, uh, that they're thinking of the health implications there, because uh, to Conrad's point, we have to make it easier uh, as we're changing these systems and the norms. It's a shift uh, in our cultural and social norms that we're asking uh, people to undertake. And that starts at the policy level. Uh, so we need to make sure that the choices at schools uh, are healthy choices, uh, that grocery stores 
uh, small or large, uh, that we are looking at policies that they have more healthy options that federally supported food programs, right? SNAP uh, and other programs like it actually incentivize fresh foods, invest fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, you know, we've gone through a process that has been very slow, um, but sure uh, in trying to make sure even for our farmers markets that those with SNAP benefits can actually use them at a farmer's market. Things like that and policies will help uh, our community members uh, be able to have greater access. Uh, I'm very hopeful uh, that as uh, they look at the uh, COVID-19 response, we know uh, that that will be one of the first areas and is one of the first areas that um, President Biden uh, and um, elect uh, and uh, Vice President-elect uh, Harris are, are looking at. Uh, that we will start to look at some of the um, disincentives uh, that healthcare providers have around wellness uh, and preventative care, particularly for things like diabetes uh, and making sure that not only uh, can a diabetic be seen to have their blood sugar monitored, but that there's actually reimbursement for them coming in and getting that cooking demonstration, that there's reimbursement for them coming in and learning how to care for themselves uh, and take care of their, themselves with respect to their, their foot exams and their eye exams and all of these other wraparound services that right now are frankly not reimbursed. You know, a, a, a diabetic has a certain number uh, of visits if they have insurance, um, private insurance to see a nutritionist. That should be a requirement that if I have diabetes, I have a nutritionist visit Every three months, I can go and see uh, a, a nutritionist that can teach me how to eat healthier and count carbs and, and all of those things. But we expect uh, for them to get a pamphlet um, for their doctor, who's not a nutritionist or a dietitian, to teach them these things. Uh, and to Conrad's point, even if you tell me what to do uh, and I'm well-meaning, I have learned and lived my entire life and my culture learning to do something else. Uh, and so we have also partnered um, with a, a program with the Jewish Federation of Greater New Orleans uh, because diabetes, while it disproportionately impacts African-Americans, one in 10 adults uh, in Louisiana has diabetes. And so it doesn't matter um, what color you are. And that's um, typical of around the United States that you're at risk uh, to uh, have virtual cooking classes and start to show our community, even in this COVID pandemic time, uh, how you can use those fresh fruits and vegetables if you have access to them uh, to make those meals uh, that you have grown up with that taste the same, because that's the other thing that we need to recognize. Most times, uh, the foods that we uh, have grown up eating, uh, if they are high in fat, high in sodium, um, high carbs, um, they taste differently, right? And so we need to recognize that. Uh, and while we can make tasty, healthier meals, acknowledge to our community members that it might not taste the same, um, but we can still make a healthy gumbo uh, and you can still enjoy it. And those are the types of things that we need to be more intentional about. Conrad, I wanted to talk a little bit about dollars and cents. You know, everyone thinks... I mean, so far, I think everyone thought of social determinants as sort of the nice thing to do, the moral thing to do. But is there a business argument that corporations uh, can make to make it the smart business choice to support social determinants of health? What kind of accountability do you have to show outcomes for the programs that you are sort of uh, invested in as Mark? Yeah, uh, great question. And, and I think it's always the one, you know, that we have to be ready and prepared to answer. And so I, I'll, I'll take it from two different lens. Um, I, I think number one, we've noticed that you have a lot more interest from investors, you know, from a Wall Street perspective, asking about our environmental, social and governance policies. And so now you've got these activist investors who are saying, I only want to invest in companies that can demonstrate that they're also being responsible citizens uh, to the world. So I think we have a responsibility to be able to say, hey, 
to the, the shareholders, they're looking for us to demonstrate our commitment to these issues. Secondly, I think if you look at just the, how things are changing in the, in the culture, you have uh, employees who are, every company will say is their greatest asset, who won't go work for a company if it's not clear where they stand on certain issues. And so the fact that employees are the lifeblood of our company, if, if we can't offer a compelling value proposition that says, this is why you should join our company, this is what we stand for, and here's the evidence to back it up, I think that also creates risk because we're all competing in this war for talent. As you think about then to kind of the, the, the dollars and cents when it comes down to it, you know, I'll give you an example. So Merck, you know, is really emerging as a leader in oncology. And so we've got products that are, you know, on the horizon for triple negative breast cancer, or for prostate cancer, or for lung cancer. Well, I'm sure Dr. Davis can attest to this. Those are all cancers that disproportionately impact the black community. And so one of the things that's important for us as an industry in order to be able to bring these products to market is that we've got to conduct clinical trials. Well, how is it that you can conduct a clinical trial for a product that disproportionately impacts a community where you only have one or 2% representation in that clinical trial? So then people love to say, well, you know, individuals don't want to participate in clinical trials because of Henrietta Lacks, because of the Tuskegee experiment. And there is some truth to that, but getting back to going to the community and actually talking to people and listening to people and understanding the systemic issues, you'll see that Medicaid doesn't cover a lot of the things that you need to actually participate in the clinical trial. You have to be able to get off of work. You've got to be able to go to follow-up visits that aren't necessarily covered by the clinical trial. So who's going to pay for that time that you missed work? Who's going to pay for you to get to and from work if you don't have transportation? What about some of the other scans or doctor's visits that you have to get? What about some of the other medications you have to take to be a part of the clinical trial in case you have some type of AE? And so it's real easy to just say, well, we made it available. We weren't discriminating. We don't understand why we can't get representation. There are these other systemic barriers that exist, trust being one of them, but the things that make it difficult to operationalize it. And so at the end of the day, getting back to policy, Medicare should be covering these things. Medicaid should be covering these things because the more inclusive we can be in our clinical trials, the better evidence we'll be able to have to understand how these products respond to these different populations to make sure that you aren't doing undue harm to any group because they were, I have to say intentionally, left out from participating in the study. Not to mention getting access to these things and these studies is one way for people to gain access to life-saving medications without the, uh, you know, the significant cost that they may require. And so for me, I think the clinical trial piece of it tells a compelling story, but I'll close quickly with the diabetes example. And so we, we understood the disparities that existed in diabetes, and I'll take the Hispanic population. So we looked at the diagnosed diabetic population, which is about somewhere, they'll, they'll say it's about 30 million for type two diabetes. We knew that a third of that population was the Hispanic population. We knew that if you look at the Hispanic population in the United States, roughly 50% are between California and Texas. So we kept digging a little bit deeper. So when you go a little bit deeper, you'll see that on average, when a person of Hispanic descent is diagnosed, their A1C is about a 10.9. And so at a 10.9, you're now based on the guidelines, you're using uh, GLP-1s, your insulin, you're going straight to injectables to try to be able to bring this down. Mm -hmm. Now, this Hispanic population also gets diagnosed at a younger age, and they're also more compliant with their medication. By us going and focusing on the Hispanic population, working with those communities, the film that we created, we created it in English and in Spanish with English subtitles. By reaching out to those communities and talking to them about pre-diabetes and diabetes, we saw a huge uptick in individuals who were actually going in to get screened for prediabetes. Now, what ended up happening is a lot of these individuals who thought they were going in to check to see if they were prediabetic ended up identifying that they had diabetes. But because we drove them in to engage in their care, they get diagnosed when they're in the earlier stages of their disease, which meant that many of the generic oral medications that are available were now accessible to them in order to be able to manage their condition. And for those that were a little bit beyond that, 
we had a product that is uh, where we position it for those who are earlier in their disease progression, the A1C of a seven or an eight. And so that created an opportunity to grow our market. And so that was a perfect example to go back to the, co the company to say, hey, we created societal value by doing this work, partnering in a genuine, authentic way. We didn't talk about our product because we knew that if people were actually to engage in their care, to get tested and to see where they were, that at some part of that process, our product would be a part of the consideration set. And that's what we saw. So that's how we got to this idea of, by talking about social determinants, health literacy, bias in the healthcare system, food insecurity, and raising people's awareness and getting them to engage in their care through the lens of prevention, we got some people to take the behavior change to not progress, but for those who were already there, they now were able to gain access to medicines that were more affordable because they caught it earlier in their disease progression rather than being later on where a more aggressive course of therapy is what's called for based on the guidelines. That's a great example. Uh, Dr. Davis, same question for you. How do you look at ROI of these um, programs? Um, yeah, that was a great example. I think that the ROI will be uh, demonstrated uh, through the uh, relationship, number one, that we build. As uh, Conrad mentioned, um, it's important for um, these organizations, companies uh, to not just show up uh, in communities, but establish meaningful relationships um, that are long-term. Uh, far too often, uh, we don't see the ROI that we'd like to see with respect to uh, outcomes uh, and uh, the um, minim minimizing or mitigating of the health disparities uh, that we see because the partnerships are episodic. Uh, so uh, number one, uh, we want to see out of this COVID-19 pandemic, the social unrest, um, the intentional investment, uh, long-term continual relationships uh, that can look at both short-term and long-term outcomes. Uh, for us, uh, we really want um, the ultimate ROI to be promoting health equity where we have uh, an integrated uh, health-based policy making um, that goes through all of the facets um, in our community. Uh, so when we are looking at creating a well community uh, and uh, economic incentives uh, for uh, reinvestment that we're thinking about the health implications uh, to those uh, particular investments. Uh, organizations uh, like NOLA BA, like our city health department uh, working together uh, with uh, our educational system uh, and our schools of public health uh, and our healthcare providers around the same table uh, talking about what business investments need to happen in communities like New Orleans East uh, are going to be what is gonna change uh, the ultimate trajectory uh, of our communities. Far too often, we're all working in silos. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, on the, the healthcare side, I'm looking at how do we you know, um, impact health equity and improve health equity and tackle diabetes. But if I'm not working with the school uh, across the street on the education, uh, of those students, teachers, parents, uh, to in having access uh, to healthy foods, having access uh, to STEM education so that they can have uh, better opportunities, having access to safe, walkable neighborhoods, uh, then we're not doing our job. Uh, so I think that the way that we begin to measure ROI is really looking at moving from the episodic partnerships that we've had and having more ingrained long-term relationships with our community as we've both been talking about how our community members need to be educated, uh, number one, on what the problem is. Uh, this is what we have learned uh, from our ancestors. So we don't see uh, the way that we live as a problem for our health um, unless we are taught that. Uh, so we have to educate our community members, then give them access to the tools uh, to be able to re-strategize, reinvent uh, the ways in which they live, work, play. That is extremely important. And then the resources, because even if you give me all the tools, as Conrad mentioned, and plop down all of this access to clinics, to parks, to gyms, to grocery stores, and I don't have the resources, 
uh, to either access it by a pair system or I don't have the ability to get there because there's no transportation or I can't take off of work, then we still haven't done our job. Uh, so that is what uh, I think we need to pivot to in a more intentional way. Uh, and that's tough, uh, as Conrad mentioned, because there is not a lot of incentive uh, for organizations uh, to function in the wellness space. Uh, but while we have the attention of the world, uh, that's what we should be pushing towards. So, Conrad, we've talked a lot about diabetes, about um, A1C uh, levels, uh, but there is also the very real comorbidity of, of depression and, and mental health. Mm. Um, is, are there any programs within Merck where you are also looking at people's behavioral health and providing any support uh, on that front? Yeah, I mean, I will say where we're starting on the behavioral health front is really within our own population. Because um, I think it's hard for you to go out there and try to solve for things um, in other communities where you haven't actually done a good job doing it within your own population health lens of, you know, looking at Merck. And so um, I, I feel like that's an area where we're continuing to invest. Uh, we're continuing to look for the appropriate partnerships. Um, we've had products in that space, but I think what we learned with behavioral health, it's not enough to try to address that from just a, a therapy perspective, you've got to be able to put the tools. And again, that's also another subject matter where there's a lot of stigma related to mental health. And so I, I do believe that um, we're probably not as advanced in, in, in mental health as we are in certain conditions like vaccines and oncology and HIV and, and other chronic diseases. But I think mental health remains a, a very important issue especially I think the greater appreciation from this past year where it's now accepted in the scientific community, the impact that being exposed to systemic racism has on people's health. And, and before stepping into this role, I, I don't think I'd ever been willing to admit it or talk about it publicly, but it's, in, it's it, I think we're in an interesting time where now people have an appreciation for how that leads and impacts mental health which then impacts certain behaviors and whether it's, you know, food behaviors or risky behaviors, how other things are triggered by the stress that having to live in a society and navigate an environment where you're constantly dealing with that, how that shows up and the type of stress it puts on your body and then the response that you have to it. So I, I think that's gonna be a unique opportunity to address, you know, mental health. I, I wanna just add one quick thing to pivot just a little bit, two quick comments. One is that, you know, I'm a marketer by training and I'm embarrassed to say that I've taken such offense with the word fresh because I can't find anything that actually says that fresh makes any different than frozen other than the fact that you get to change and charge significantly more for fresh food than you do for frozen food. So I, I think there needs to be a bit of a, a frozen food revolution to happen because the price points are so different. And again, that might be something that can actually make nutritious foods more accessible to many more communities, especially when you don't have to think about spoilage, which is often an issue when you're buying fresh foods. And then the last thing I'll say is that I do believe this is a moment when everyone is engaged in this topic of social justice for people to realize that education and uh, economic inclusion and transportation and you know access to the internet and broadband and climate change and environmental issues are all social justice issues. And so I, I do think there's a unique opportunity that we have to tap into this right now as people are, are attuned to social justice, while there's definitely a need for reforms around policing and sentencing and, and drug laws, I think there's so much that can be done to really think about a health and all policies approach to really help us think about how we can start to do things differently in the next 10 years. You make a good point about fresh versus frozen. Anytime I think of frozen, I think of high sodium processed food, but there's frozen spinach, there's frozen carrots and peas and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the one thing I would uh, mention is, you know, both of you talked and you're sort of preaching to the choir here, but again, I'll play that devil's advocate role. Uh, both of you talked a lot about social uh, justice that requires um, a fair amount of investment by either state or federal government. And you've talked about empowering patients by teaching them the nutritional value of this or that, helping them 
through virtual cooking lessons, people that are opposed to this philosophy will sort of describe it as you're trying to create a nanny state. How do you address that? And I'll, that tough question is at you, Dr. Davis. <laughs> Sure. Um, I, I think uh, we address it head on uh, in stating that, you know, oftentimes uh, we have really placed the burden on community members on this behavior change. Right. We look at, at just in Louisiana uh, over um, two billion dollars spent associated with diabetes care. Right. That we could be using in a different way to invest in our communities. Uh, and we say, well, you know, people just need to get out and they need to walk more. Uh, they should eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, they, they should have more physical activity. They need to see their doctor. And we don't look at the centuries uh, of, as we've stated here, federal, state, and local policies and practices that have led to systemic barriers. So while it will take investment, we have intentionally invested in a system um, that has excluded many of our community members from having access to the same resources uh, that others with power, privilege, uh, and money have had. Uh, and most of them uh, are in the majority population, at least for now. Uh, and uh, so we need to tackle and say, this is not a nanny state. We're just righting the wrongs uh, that have been done for centuries to keep our communities healthy. Uh, and if our communities are healthier, then we will all benefit from the return on investment because our healthcare costs will go down for all of us. Uh, and we will be able to then uh, really speak to health equity for all. Um, but providing people opportunity and access um, that is equivalent uh, to those with power and privilege, um, I would say is not a nanny state. Uh, it is the right thing to do. Uh, for us to be equitable to all. Not everybody's gonna make those choices, right? We're not, we're not all uh, making healthy choices every day. We spoke about the fact that, you know, it is difficult um, sometimes as working professionals uh, for all of us to go home every night and cook uh, a well-balanced meal uh, as um, we, are, we know we should be doing. And sometimes it's easier to roll into uh, a fast food restaurant, but fast food, rest fast food restaurants also have some healthy options. So if we can begin to stop vilifying them and using the opportunities that they provide uh, to working families uh, and saying, hey, even if you just decided not to get the sugary drink, but maybe the water or the unsweetened tea this time, look at how many calories you could cut out. Or if you chose the apple slices, just this one time a week versus the fries, give people the opportunity to make choices that are easy and accessible to them. That access is what is gonna help us move closer to health equity. So we're kind of close to uh, the hour, but I don't wanna let you guys go before I ask them one final question. Um, and that is about what 2021 and the future will bring. Uh, we are at a really dark point in terms of COVID-19 spread in the U.S. Um, and certainly there won't be any policy change for a while on that front. Uh, what do you feel at this moment in, in America about tackling these really intractable issues? Are you cautiously optimistic? Are you wildly hopeful? Uh, Conrad, we'll start with you. <laughs> uh, wow. Okay. You know, <laughs> What I, what I will say is that one of the best things I think that came out of 2020 was this language of essential workers. And I say that because I think for maybe the first time people understood the impact that the underserved community actually has in our economy. And that created that need for that ROI when people are like, oh wow, if, I, if, if these people represent more than almost a half of all the essential jobs, the things that allows our economy to run, if they don't have access to health and healthcare and they can get out there and work or they're forced to work even when they're sick, that's not a good day. And so for me, I think this appreciation and understanding that you've got a large percentage of our population that are essential to our economy, understanding that some of the reasons why they're at risk are because of these structural issues, I think that gives me a lot of hope 
that as a part of dealing with COVID, we're going to have to confront that issue head on. And so I, I do think uh, a lot of that will be the work that will happen in, in, in 2021. And I hope that starts to, to turn the tide to push us towards health equity. And I love what Dr. Davis said. Uh, I'm a big fan of reframing issues. Um, and I think what we need to do right now is to help people understand that uh, if you want the government uh, to not spend as much as we do on healthcare, then we need to support policies that's gonna make it um, equitable for everybody to have the ability to obtain the optimal levels of health. And, and I think this new administration has a, a good understanding of that. And I think within whatever powers they may have whether at the federal level or the state level, or even you know local levels, the more that the leaders can start to implement policy changes that can create that environment, I think we'll be better off. Great, Dr. Davis. Yes, I love that. Um, the focus on essential workers and, and I will say just uh, to add to it, I, I think 2021, uh, I am cautiously optimistic um, and that if one of the uh, additional things that this pandemic forced us to do um, was uh, to pay particular attention to um, the differences uh, in outcomes based on race. Um, I think that for a long time, we've uh, tried to, as a country, uh, to state that these differences uh, in the way that um, we treat certain members of our community, whether it's around policing uh, or healthcare, had to do with defective character traits or some willful destructive decisions that people were making. I think during this time, we were able uh, to clearly see uh, that whether it was COVID-19 uh, or it were was unarmed uh, African-American men on the street um, that uh, when you took away all of the underlying um, associated potential reasons, it had to do with race. So our country um, is now starting to deal with uh, the very uncomfortable uh, topic again uh, around um, differences based on race. And I think that I have um, a, a, a sentiment of um, hopeful optimism um, for our um, new administration coming in, recognizing that and being able to speak directly to it. Uh, and hopefully then putting forth policy change um, with real resources um, to be able to impact it. So, and that will help us not just around um, healthcare, um, but through these systemic structural racism um, policies and practices that are throughout um, all of our um, uh, community uh, related organizations, uh, our governmental organizations, private sector, um, for all of us to start really tackling these issues. We've seen uh, a growth, right, of diversity, equity, and inclusion work uh, being done uh, in several organizations. And that's the start to acknowledge that there is a problem, uh, whether intentionally or not, uh, that we're all a part of. And Dr. Davis, I know we had time. The last thing I'll, I'll say is that the poverty is growing during this period. And I think it was Dr. King that realized that poverty was something that could unite the country. Yeah. And so I do think that if these groups that are in the lower rungs of the society can actually come together, they'd be amazed to see how much power they actually have to drive this agenda. So that, that's the other thing that I hope is that um, that for all the things that people see that divide us, I think that these groups can find commonality and find strength in the numbers around that shared experience to bring about change. Yes. I'm not a religious person at all, but amen to that. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you again to Dr. Davis and to Conrad. This was a great session. I really, really appreciate your time.